The little quote at the bottom, one can't help feeling sorry for the individuals spent a fortune on cabs trying to find the dull man at Greenwich when he really wanted to go green man at Dulwich, is um, not really, it's, it was common about the turn of the, uh, turn of the last century, 1900, there were quite a lot of newspaper articles with that quote in it. They obviously thought it was hilarious at the time, but um, perhaps not so. Now, when you look at the sad picture of the Grove Tavern as it is today, taken about a week ago, um, you know, how have we let things get this far? But anyway, let's go back. Let's go back in time um, to its predecessor, the Green Man. Now, this is John Roke's map of 1746. And you can't uh, hang on, you'll get a better view. But here is the Dulwich Wells. And there is a close up. So here is Lordship Lane, where my arrow is. You can just see Court Lane. You can see the Dulwich Court there. Um, obviously, the road layout, not quite what it is um, wood today. There's Dulwich Common. And there it is in the corner with the woods up here. And this, we think, is a rather badly drawn version of Cox's Walk. But we'll come on to that in a minute. This is a different map, slightly later map. Uh, Lordship Lane again. Here, it, here is the green man on the corner, but it actually does call it the green man. And it talks about the Dulwich, the Dulwich Wells. And we'll come on to that in just a minute. So looking at the, the, the green man's first mentioned about 1690, um, but nothing really much happens until uh, the premises are let to John Cox, citizen and vintner of London. Um, in about 1730 and his son William takes over not long afterwards and it is he who is digging a well in the in the gardens of the of the the pub or the the place um when they discover well he di he digs the well late in the year and it's dry then he comes covers it over and he comes back the following uh spring in 19 in 1741 and he finds there's water in it, and it's um, it appears to have um, you know curative properties, um, and it's very similar to the water. The more, more famous water at the time was at Sydenham Wells, where Sydenham Wells Park is, and of course that's where Cox built Cox's Walk in order to provide a better way to get from his pub through to Sydenham, and that's where Cox's Walk is today. I've shown this picture. In fact, we don't have a picture of the green man, unfortunately. Uh, the nearest I can suggest is it probably looked a bit like the plough on Lordship Lane, which looked like this. And the plough, of course, is much the old plough, not what you see there today. What you see there today is the 1850s. But the old plough, which this is, dates from 1730, so much the same time. So I suspect it probably looked a little bit like this. But you can see here in 1754, when they got a new lease, uh, they had a coach house, barn, stables, brew house, assembly room, garden, orchard, and eight acres of land. So let's just, and this is an advertisement that uh, Cox had in the Daily Advertiser in 1744. And you can see here, he talks about the, all the water, the volatile spirit, a catabastic salt, alkaline earth and sulfur, and it's an efficacious cure of almost an in infinite number of diseases. So it's the cure all for everything. It removes obstructions, purifies the blood and exhilarates the spirits. Um, what more can you say? But it was a great attraction, um, albeit not very easy to get there. I mean, you think that well, you could come along Lordship Lane. There was no South Circular as we understand it. So you really couldn't come from the West and you'd have to either come on your horse or you'd walk. Um, although he says it's not five or six miles from any part of London, perhaps. But in those days, they didn't worry. That was the only way. They had no choice. That was the only way of going there. So that's 1744. But just to give you a little bit of, um, and I don't expect you to read all of these, but these are all um uh, robberies and deaths in the area i mean the sydenham hills was well 18th century country was a pretty dangerous place 
Um, the foot pads um, used to you know, hang around and take, um, as you got it here, this farmer uh, who's attacked by two foot pads and robbed of 30 shillings in his watch near the green man. Uh, or these four ladies were walking across the wood, perhaps not wisely, to have their breakfast at the green man where they'd order their coach to meet them. So they were obviously at the top of Sydenham Hill, just about to walk down Cox's Walk and they met another foot pad who robbed them of about eight pounds. That was a lot of money then. That was several hundred pounds. Uh, and here you get a gentleman robbed by, near the green man at Dulwich. So I think, um, I mean, this is, there's not a huge number of uh, newspaper quotes like this, but clearly it wasn't quite as, um, as safe as um, Mr. Cox would like you to think. And of course, here is the poor chap who dived in the pond opposite the house in order to clear the pipes. Uh, but hit his head on the way down and died before they could get him out. So Cox, the grandson, they were all tend to be called William, sold the remainder of his lease to a, a wine merchant in Westminster called Rolls or Rowles. Rowles turned it very quickly to a Charles Maxwell within a year, and it was Maxwell who renamed the pub the Dulwich Grove. Then Rolls tried to renew the lease and fell out with the, the master, or the master at that time of Dulwich College was Thomas Allen, and here he is, um, who was a very, very difficult man, even by the standards of the time. And there was a real problem with leases. Um, it went, uh, Maxwell wasn't the only, Rolls wasn't the only one who fell out. Max, uh, and Maxwell, likewise, they, he wouldn't renew the lease beyond 21 years, whereas the implied agreement was that you could have 42 years. In fact, it went to the court, went to high court in the end, and Thomas Allen lost. And one of the people dealing with it was Lord Thurlow over here, who moved into the, but uh, moved into the pub, or not into the pub because the pub had gone by then. Um, because they couldn't renew the lease, it just took too long. And we think people thought either the waters ran out or people just got less interested in it. There were other things for them to do. Uh, but Lord Thurlow was having a house built in Knights Hill. And um, it took so long and he fell out with big time with his architect and he lived in the pub um, while the house was being built. Um, he was a man with unmarried, although he had uh, mistresses and several illegitimate children, even though he was the Lord Chancellor. Different standards in those days. The question we think is, is who actually, what did, I mean, I, I talked earlier about the, the pub looking a bit like a shack, um, but did um, Rolls or Maxwell or even Lord Thurlow build something a bit more substantial? I cannot imagine Lord Thurlow living in a hut on the site. Um, so we think it's possible that he, that one of these built something more substantial. This is what became uh, Dr. Glenny's Academy. And we will see Dr. Glenny's Academy here. Now, here is this most famous pupil, George Byron, Lord Byron. Uh, so Dr. Glenny's Academy was, uh, Brown Green wrote a couple of, um, a journals ago about him and his family and uh, he ran this school at this on the, on the corner and here's you know with a bit of imagination it could look like it could have looked like a pub a rather grand building um, and if you look at the 1808 um, map the estate map here it is you can see the two projecting if you look at that with the projecting bits here and here here it is here so it was that's the position but it was put, uh, Glenny died in 18, and here's Cox's Walk leading up into the woods. Glenny died in the late 1820s, and the, uh, the, the building was left pretty well to, to, roll, to rot, as it were. Nothing happened. And uh, the estate pulled the building down uh, in the early 1830s. And then they let the ground to a chap called Bew, Francis Bew and his wife, who was known as well, Mary Bew, uh, but known as Old Mother Bew. Um, and they set up a, a sort of uh, another, they built another shack in the gardens. Um, and here's a couple of shots of it. Um, rather, I mean, we don't know whether that's, I mean, the, 
lithographs done in the 1870s. Um, so maybe they remembered it, but um, they ran it for about 20 years. Um, Francis Bew died and Mary Bew took it over and she continued with her son, uh, who will come across shortly, uh, J.T. Owen. She ended up in the almshouses in, in, the, in the village. Uh, but the, by 1850s, by the 1850s, that had been knocked down and the site had been put up for sale for housing because the estate had worked out that houses were coming to East Dulwich, but they had no, they had no interest from anybody, no interest. And you can see here, here are the two maps from 1860. Um, here's Cox's Walk. Uh, there's nothing here at all. And then you hear just 16 years later, here's Cox's Walk again, and of course the railway. And that's the key to the development. Here's the tavern and there's the church. So it was all developed after 1860. And the key driver, if you like, is the Lord arrival of Lordship Lane Station. And it's interesting, when you read the Dulwich Estate Minutes, um, they're having discussions with the railway company and in January 1862, and just a week later, they then have an approach from Courage, the Brewers, to build a pub. So I think the somebody had let them in on it that the railway was coming. They thought this is there used to be a pub there. Uh, this is a great location for a pub with a station around the corner. So they and the estate were, you know, they hadn't been able to shift the land, so they were quite keen to talk to Courage and agreed and agreed to deal. Here's Lordship Lane Station, as it used to be, of course, long gone now, uh, but it was quite an imposing building. And obviously they had uh, pretensions that it was going to be quite a busy station. Of course, we now know it never really was, uh, but that was the driver. The driver for the construction of the pub was the arrival of the railway line. Uh, and the station, the pub was up and running uh, late 1862, early 1863. The station came slightly afterwards, but, um, and here it is. Here's Cox's Walk. Here you can see the station. This is the Ordnance Survey of 1970. Here's the Grove Tavern on the corner. It's been built by this time, but the area is still known as Bew's Corner. And as late as this, you could, um, if you look online, there are some old uh, Hackney carriage rates from Camberwell to Bew's Corner. It wasn't, it wasn't thought of as the Grove Tavern then. There we go, hang on. And here it is, here's the Grove Hotel. And here on the right is the um, Newington licensing uh, application from James Thomas Owen, J.T. Owens, uh, old mother Owens, old Mary Owens' son, and him stating uh, the house was large and commodious, which it certainly was, if you look at that. Um, a great deal of building was being carried on the neighbourhood, quite right. Houses on the other side of the road, on East Dulwich, on the Fry and Manor Farm Estate and things like this. And no other licensed house would be allowed near this one. The estate had agreed that with courage, that if they were going to build a pub here, if he, courage would build the pub, they would make sure that there were no other pubs nearby. And there was no opposition, so he got his licence. And here he is. So he's up and trading late 1862, early 1863. Uh, literally on the corner of, as we know, Lordship Lane on this side and Dulwich Common on that side. Uh, here's another shot of the pub. Um, and here are the list of the landlords and licensees. It's quite difficult to work out who was just a manager or a licensee, if you like, and who actually owned the pub. But these are the people that were involved. As you can see, fair few number. Uh, Owen left in late 1860s, Wilson didn't last very long, um, and we'll come on to Fruin because he, he gets, he goes and then comes back. Uh, and you end up here, this is the last, the last landlord or was in 1823 when the old pub was pulled down, but we've got a way to go before we get there. Um, all the pubs at that time would have had stables, and here is a shot of the Grove Tavern stables, which were on Lordship Lane, I'm uh, sorry, on Dulwich Common. So here you are, Dulwich Common, um, the carriage, and here you are in the winter. Similar view in the winter. So the stables were accessed from uh, Dulwich Common. Here's an advertisement, uh, JTO in the Clerkenwell News, 1864. 
um, selling the Grove Tavern, enjoy the country air, go, go to the, come to the Grove Tavern, the rural scenery, accommodation for dinner and tea parties. If you like swings, coits, bowls or crickets. And of course, the key element to it, the train is just nearby. Um, he calls it Dulwich Station. Well, if you were coming from Dulwich Station, which was, of course, what we now know as West Dulwich, I think it would be a touch more than a six minute walk. But he means Lordship Lane. So it would cost you sixpence. Again, a fair, a fair sum of money in those days when a beer, when beer, a, a tankard of beer was was a lot less than that. Um, and here's a couple of um, positive press reviews. Uh, to how everybody they used to go to Bew's Corner and now they go to the Grove Tavern. Um, grounds, very picturesque grounds, large number with a large number of visitors. The fun of the fair, natural beauties, everybody happy. And here we have, um, he obviously used to provide uh, catering. And here we have Messrs Downs, who are the contractors for the Dulwich College, the new Dulwich College at the time. Uh, had a hundred of their workmen at a banquet. Again, JT Owen, here he is. Uh, the Grove Tavern, that Bew's Corner. Um, yeah. Very good banquet. So catering, I mean, you know, Victorian pubs were very similar to operate. In fact, better because there wasn't there wasn't really much so much choice. Um, a, a not an uncommon problem in Victorian time was um, illegal weights and measures. And here's poor old J.T. Owen in court. Um, his defence was he's a highly respectable tradesman. Um, and but basically it was down to his punters who were very careless with because uh, in those days it was all pewter pots and they threw them about not glasses um he did everything he could to prevent them and he didn't believe there was any deficiency but um as i said chairman of the board said the bench said we think you're a good chap and i don't think you're you know you're doing anything wrong but you'll only get a pound and uh but whether it was that um, or, and in fact, it was more likely his wife died. Uh, J.T. Owen's wife died at this time and he put the pub up for sale. And here's the advertisement, um, 1866, 67. And here you have the selling it with a valuable lease and goodwill with possession. They always, in those days, called it, they always wanted to be aspirational. So it was always desirable and there was always scope for improvement suburban wine and spirit attack with gardens 21 years from the estate and 295 pounds an annum per year again quite a bit of money um, they mentioned the dulwich estate uh proximity of the house the railway stations easy access from london by road and rail um and there's the implication again that the time jtn really hasn't had the opportunity to get his act together uh, but he does. It, it, it takes a time for it to sell, but he does move on in the end. And this is where he moves to. Um, and what's interesting, it's in these adverts, he's advertising his new pub, which is the Sand Rock, which is unfortunately just recently closed. Interestingly, just closed. Um, he always says, and this is just one of a number of adverts in the press at the time, and he always says, late of the Grove Tavern Dulwich. So, and you can see he's using the same sort of crib uh, advertisement, albeit for a different pub. Um, not quite sure where he says here temperance societies, why the temperance society uh, would go to a pub, but anyway, there we go, near the station. But um, so he's moved on. The next uh, landlord or licensee is Chapel Wilson. Here's one of his advertisements. Um, again, same sort of thing bean feast, dinner societies. Yeah, it's uh, and there's a picture of it, rather glamorous picture. Um, so Wilson, he does a bit of advertising, but he doesn't last very long. And the next landlord here, I've just shown this because um, I'm not expecting to read this, but this is um, James Henderson, who is a local worthy newspaper owner, prospective parliamentary, failed prospective parliamentary candidate, but a wealthy and influential man. And he has a dinner here for his for his guests, for his employees. And quite fascinating, they have, and he employs these two, they were known as, yeah, actors, basically, tragedian, tragedians, uh, who came in, you know, to, to give a performance. And, um, and I managed to, funnily enough, find the pictures of the blokes themselves. Uh, interesting haircuts some of them have, but yeah, good. 
Henderson was was quite a local character, and he had he lived along Lordship Lane, and there's his his own house no longer is is no longer there, but the, quite a few of the houses he built around are still there. But he was uh, a local character and a user, obviously a user of the pub. Sports that was quite a common thing. We had the St George's Harriers Cross Country Club uh, with their slow run running around the Dulwich area. You have Norwood United Football Club, um, all playing in the grounds of the pub because there was quite a lot of uh, sports grounds, roughly where, where the blocks of flats are now. That was sports grounds. And again, another uh, competition here. So there was a lot of sports. Here's a, another, another landlord, Alfred William Crow, caught, um, caught with underweight measures, but um, he was fined slightly more. So obviously the, uh, the um, magistrate didn't believe him quite so well. So sporting, lots of sport. It was a really uh, busy, busy pub, popular pub. And in 1888, they uh, put up this, um, this plaque uh, to commemorate um, it's the building. Well, obviously the building wasn't Dr. Glenny's Academy, but Dr. Glenny's school was on, on the site. Um, to commemorate the hundredth anniversary of the, of the birth of um, Lord George Byron, and here's a shot taken around 1900. You're standing in Lordship Lane, looking down. There's the shots on the right. Uh, you can just see, actually, that's Henderson's house there, just at the back. There, the one we talked. Here's the pub, and you come round the corner, and this is where, I mean. <laughs> Here are the railings. This is now where the war memorial is, of course, but uh, you can see the railings still there of the church. And one of the things the pub also used to run was charity cricket matches, uh, and a real advocate of these was the musical uh, star Dan Lino. And um, here's one of um, and here's one of them. And you say four thousand people turned up, uh, which is um, the Dulwich estate, of course, weren't quite so pleased because it brought the sort of the wrong sort of people into the area. And there's quite a lot of correspondence between them and um, Courage's about uh, the type of people that were coming to watch these things and how terrible they were and the things they did when they walked to and from the pub. And in fact, um, Courage changed there. That's where the two uh, threw and was, this was Asher here, who was the landlord when all this was being done. And they sacked him basically and brought back the previous guy, much to the Dulwich estate's satisfaction. Anyway, they were quite, that was quite about around 1900, 1902. And of course, Dan Lino was a, a resident of Dulwich for a short period in Stradella Road. Um, here's another thing that, well, obviously the church over the road and the pub, um, this is a wedding of, um, Frank Edward Falls, uh, who married Fruins, who was the landlord's daughter, and then took over the pub and, and uh, basically kicked his father-in-law out. But you can see, you know, 200, 200 presents, 200 people, over a thousand pounds was spent on the um, reception. That's pretty, that's again, a pretty large sum of money, but handy for the church. So there must've been quite a lot of, um, What's the word? Sim simpatico business between the two of them. Um, and the gardens, this is, as those of you who will spot, this is clearly not a early 1900s photograph of the Grove Gardens because that's a Ford Anglia driving around, but this is the nearest I could get. But it was a substantial garden. Um, and here they had, they ran summer, summer events and they had this chap called Buster Sachs, who was in charge of the arrangements. And he brought all his, uh, music hall stars in to do it, in to, in to perform. You've got the comedian, the pianist, the soprano, the bass, and the King Cole, the humorist, the baritone. Uh, it must have been quite a, quite a go. I mean, uh, I suspect the estate weren't, weren't consulted uh, about this, but uh, yeah, a good way of making money. But of course, the other thing not to read is the arrival of the trams. Now, the tr electric trams arrived in 1906 as far as um, the uh, plough and extended 1907, 1908 towards Forest Hill. So here we are at about 1907. Here's the tram coming past. Here's the, the junction uh, of the Grove. Uh, here's a few adverts of, um, you know, they were quite good at advertising. Here's Fruin, 
Um, in the early 1900s, advertising the pub, here it is, near the railway line, dinners, lunch, lunch box, chops, steaks, tea and coffee, clubs, dinner. Here's his successor, his son-in-law, Frank Fells, uh, doing much the same, you know, what you can do there. And here's the music, the open-air bioscope, which was, you assume, some kind of open-air film. Um, and, uh, you know, this is their entertainment in, in, the, uh, in the garden. Here's another shot um, of, the, of the electric tram and the grove, just 1914, but it was starting to look a little bit um, run down by then. Uh, it was also a bus stop, as we'll see later. And here is the about changes, Thomas Tilling changes his, changing his bus services to and from. So it was quite a, with the plough, it was quite a popular, um, public transport interchange. And here's the new Grove Tavern um, with an old bus in front of it. Um, the old Grove Tavern was um, looking pretty grim by the early 20s and Courage were persuaded to take it down. There were a lot of argument about what they should rebuild, but obviously what they rebuilt is what you see today. Um, but in the end, they all agreed uh, and it was continued. And here is here it is here in the, in the Late 20s, you can see the old bus where you still went up the outside to get to it. And here is the report on the opening ceremony where Mr. Kirby, who was the Courage's uh, in-house architect, was praised for, you know, the great building he's produced. Um, you know, it was opened by Commander Courage, who presumably for and, uh, and the MP for Norwood and the Mayor of Camberwell. So it was, it was big time stuff. Um, you know, the Courage is saying, a lot of their, you know, their recent rebuilt after World War One, they grow to were able to wreck the house they desired, and they thank the New England Justice and the Dulwich Estate for their help. Yeah, I suspect through clenched teeth. Um, but um, but uh, how quite again they go on to say reconstruction. Well, the best aid is temperance. I'm not quite sure because temperance is not drinking. I'm not quite sure how that worked. But anyway, the, the Mayor of Camberwell gave them a toast. And it was, you know, it had been it had been a successful pub, and it continued to be a successful pub. Here's some more sports, slightly different uh, midget golf, I assume, uh, and of course the hard tennis courts for hire. Open air dancing commences May the second. Uh, it was it was obviously a centre for activity. Here's another shot taken in the early 1930s. Um, Again, the, the, the crossroads, as we know, but a little bit more dangerous today and a few more cars than um, we expected then. And here we are in the 1940s. Uh, again, the cars could be just be parked in the front. But here's an interesting thing. There was, this is a 1948 quote. And the, uh, there was a suggestion that the pub was going to be pulled down and they're going to build a roundabout. Um, you know, the South Circular Road here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, just as well they didn't, but you can see why they, it was a few years before traffic lights were to come. Um, but uh, yeah, so you've got the, and they talk here about Campbell Council's flats on the side of the sports ground behind, uh, and the pub was going to go. But luckily it didn't. And here's another shot. Um, and this, 1957, the traffic lights were installed and motorists start cutting across to get round them. Uh, and complaints, there were traffic signals that um, people are cutting through uh, around the corner there, but they're nice 1950s motor cars. And here, this is, some people remember the Peacock Room, Dulwich's latest luxurious lounge bar restaurant, which was in the pub. Uh, this is an advert from 1962, gateway to the finest cuisine in South London. Um, not sure it ended up like that, but there we go. And here's some of the happy landlords. This is in the 1970s, Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner, who, who may have been there when the, the uh, peacock room was there. But here you could, you could sit outside, you wouldn't do that now, but you could sit outside. And they were the finalists um, for the pub of the year, the 1972 pub of the year. Um, and it, and the, the quote above me is about the breath, of course, the breathalyzer. 
1967, and they were quoted that uh, they they went because um, it was a large and popular pub. They went there to interview people, and um, you know people were saying they were eating orange juice. But of course, in many ways, that was the pub's the pub's problem. There had always been a limited amount of, if you like, passing foot traffic. It was a pub you drove to or you walked to or in the old days you you rode your horse to um and you know they had a big car park at the back um and it says in in the in the evening standards talk about the its good points and bad points they said you know look, it's a very popular pub but a lot of people drive here and of course you don't drive to pubs anymore and that's i think one of its problems it didn't the the rumor is it did win but the facts are it didn't win it was it was placed second and of course the judges were jimmy edwards well he's not so much in favor now um but anyway yes yeah, so you've got there mr and mrs faulkner and then here you have i mean the the bar lambs are larger than life so he Mint sauce, not quite clear what happened to mint sauce when he got bigger, but he drank Hofmeister, Hofmeister lager. And we have the licensee, Robert Buchanan, uh, with her. Uh, and I'm sure she was popular. Um, not sure she'd be too popular at the bar eating a sandwich and pulling off the bag of crisps, but you know, all good promo. Uh, nice sign, and there's uh, and then it becomes a harvester. Many of you, I'm sure, will remember that. Here's a shot taken in the early 2000s where it's still a harvester. Look, it's interesting. You could sit outside, although I can't believe you would want to, given the amount of traffic. And while it was a harvester, it was a great success. Uh, again, people drove to it. It had a gardens, lots of you know, entertainment on a Sunday and what have you. It really did well. And the problem came from when it lost the harvester branding. For whatever reason, I'm not sure who owned Harvesters at the time, uh, but it was one of the pubs that was sold to the Stonegate pubs. And Stonegate pubs took it over. And here we are in the late 2000s or, um, and slightly different pay and continued to run it and tried to push it a bit up market. But the loss of the Harvester, its business was at the cheaper end and it just didn't work. Uh, they weren't getting the punters in. And as we know, there was a fire in the kitchen in 2012, never really been able to get to the bottom of the story as to why they never, why they decided that it was too expensive to do it up. Um, there are rumours that the they weren't properly insured or the amount of damage done by the fire exposed um far more that the that the pub really was in a terrible condition you know and they would literally they would have to spend too much money uh in putting it right and there was a question over the whether the business was still there so unfortunately we're in the position now as we all know um 10 years on we're coming up 11 years on uh they continue to pay the rent to the Dulwich estate uh and it continues to look like um you know, it's covered in graffiti, a ruined building. The only bright spark, of course, is the Grove Cavern Skate Park. At least they found a use for the for the car park in the interim. Um, I mean, that's only relatively recently, but you can see the size of the car park. And there is no doubt it is, it's a very good development site. The Dulwich Estate did make some preliminary, uh, had some preliminary discussions with Southwark about what they might do. Um, and we thought at one time they come to some sort of agreement, but Southwark changed their minds. And the real argument is about whether they keep the building or not. Um, the building is now locally listed. I think Southwark have accepted the fact that the, the likely there is no demand for a pub on this site or not a pub of this kind. Um, there might be a demand for much smaller, uh, a bit like over the road, if you go into go around there now, the Lordship Lane, there's the Dulwich Dispensary over the road, a much smaller, something like that might work. But the question now is how much of the site can be redeveloped and should the old building stay there? Um, but we, but uh, we don't know what's happening. So as we stand at the moment, of course, 
we come to the end and here it is again looking very sad and very run down and not a very good advertisement for um, the entrance to Dulwich. Um, you know, the society had been on and on at the estate to do something, um, but they seem I don't know, unwilling, incapable. Um, and the, the tenant likewise just can't be bothered. So we're stuck with it. But I think um, the lease runs out in, I think, a couple of years. Um, presumably, and there are rumours that the estate is talking to Southwark again. Um, let's see what happens. Hopefully, um, something will happen. <laughs>